Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Planetarium show. My name is Jessica. I'm the director of the Planetarium, and with me is not my alter ego. Um, that That is Eli, who's going to be voice in the sky for us under my name, apparently. Um, I'm going to give you a hard time for that. Uh, but do you want to say hi? Hi, everyone. You can't see me, but I'm Eli. I'm a physics student at UMD. Um, so tonight is the next part in our exploration series, and I decided this month we are going to take a look at stars. Uh, we've talked a bit about stars a lot throughout many of our different shows and talk about things that stars can turn into, like white dwarfs, and neutron stars, and black holes, but we've never really pieced together like how exactly they form, what happens to them uh, as they're living, and why they turn into what they do as they die. So that's that's the idea for our show tonight. Um, as always, if you have any questions, you can leave them down in the comments. Eli is going to uh, keep an eye on those for me. Well, let me know when those questions come up. All right, let me get everything ready. And let's get into this. Um, so we are going to start with the birth of stars, because that is, of course, the beginning of the story. Um, and stars are born in nebulae. So a nebula is a giant cloud of gas and dust. If you've been to some of our past shows, we've talked about different types of nebula that are out there. The kind that stars form in are what we call star-forming regions, which makes sense. They're regions that form stars. Um, these are a couple of the most famous. We have the Pillars of Creation on the left and the Orion Nebula on the right. Now, what makes these ideal for forming stars, I'm just going to set my phone over here because Eli's watching comments for me. I don't have to do it. Um, what makes these ideal for star forming is the fact that these clouds are very dense and pretty cold. So that dense cloud means the atoms are a bit closer together. And by being cold, that means the atoms and the gas aren't moving super fast. They're moving pretty slowly. And so that can create the perfect conditions for gravity to start pulling in that gas together and starting to clump it together. Uh, and that kind of starts our whole process. So um, over about you know, 10 million, 100 million years, um, this whole process gets started where we have this big, dense cloud of gas, and somewhere in there, gravity wins out and starts to pull some of that gas together, creating a little clump, a little dense nugget inside of that gas cloud. And as that little dense core starts getting bigger, as it pulls in more gas, its gravity grows and that allows it to pull in even more gas. And so this process continues with this little dense core growing bigger and bigger and bigger as it pulls in more and more gas. And of course, as it's growing bigger and denser, it's also getting hotter and hotter. And at this point, we have what's known as a protostar. It's, it's a, it's a little hot blob that's on its way to becoming a star, but isn't quite one yet. Um, now, within these big gas clouds, this is happening hundreds of times um, over and over again, all at roughly the same time. So you end up with hundreds and thousands of stars being born roughly together in the same time, which also gives you an idea of how giant these star forming regions really are to form thousands of stars out of them. Well, as that dense nugget grows bigger and hotter, if it pulls in enough material, it's able to get hot enough that nuclear fusion it kicks off at the center in what becomes the core of the star. And in this case, we have hydrogen fusion, where um, four hydrogen atoms, which is just a proton, um, slam together uh, through a, a step through a, a three-step process that I'm not going to get into all the details of. But basically, you start with four hydrogen atoms, and they end up slamming together, sticking together to form a helium nucleus, a helium atom, and that also releases energy. And at that point, once nuclear fusion has started, we now have 
a star. We have created a star. Now I did say you have to have enough mass in that dense, hot protostar in order for this to take place. You need to have about 0 0.08 solar masses, which is about 80 Jupiters inside of this dense, hot protostar in order for it to get hot enough at the center for nuclear fusion to start up and therefore become a star. If our little dense protostar doesn't quite make it there, that means fusion can't start and we have a failed star, which we call brown dwarfs. And so these lie in the range between about 13 Jupiter masses up to about 80 Jupiter masses. And anything smaller than that is planet sized. Um, so you have to pull in enough material to get hot enough for that fusion to start and then you have a star. Now this star that is burning hydrogen into helium in its core is what we call a main sequence star. Uh, and stars spend about 90% of their lives in this phase where they are just sitting there turning that hydrogen that's in their core into helium that releases energy and it's that energy release that actually keeps the star stable because there's a battle going on. Gravity keeps wanting to pull everything in, wanting to contract the star and make it smaller and smaller. But there's an outward push by the gases and by the energy released by that nuclear fusion. And that outer push balances gravity trying to pull everything in, and that keeps the star stable and happy and burning happily for 90% of its life. Now, stars that are in this main sequence phase come in a variety of sizes and colors. Um, so we can see here that we have very small main sequence stars. These are much cooler. These are the coolest stars um, and the lowest mass and are also the smallest and are red in color because they're so cool. Then as our main sequence stars get bigger, in mass, they also get bigger in radius and diameter. They get hotter and they get brighter, all the way up to the biggest stars on the main sequence are the most massive, the brightest, and the hottest. And they end up shining this really brilliant blue because of how hot they are. Now, what's interesting about this is we see this pattern in main sequence stars. Right? These small stars are dim, cool, and red, while the big stars are massive, hot, and super bright. But this also correlates to a lot of other things about them. And one thing that I want to point or kind of pay attention to is the lifetime of these stars. Because not all stars live for the same amount of time. Those really, really big, hot blue stars, the biggest main sequence stars that are out there, even though they're so big and have so much mass, they're burning through their fuel at an incredibly fast pace and actually end up dying in only 10 to 100 million years. They have super short lifetimes. And so they live and die very quickly because they just plow through that fuel. Now, on the other end of things, those really small, dim red stars, even though they are less massive and therefore have less fuel, they're also not burning through it very fast. So these stars last for tens to hundreds of trillions of years. And way of thinking about that is these really small red stars have not died yet. The very first ones that were ever born have not died yet because their age, their lifetime, uh, their lifetime, not their age, their lifetime is longer than the total age of our universe so far. So we've actually never seen what it looks like when one of those really, really small red stars die because we're nowhere near the end of their life yet. All right. So we have our main sequence star 
Um, they sit here burning hydrogen into helium for about 90% of their lifetimes, and we see here how that lifetime varies depending on how massive the star is. So what happens at the end of its life? Uh, after that you know, super long time spent as a main sequence star. And it turns out that different things happen depending on how massive that star is. Now, we already said for the really, 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 really low mass, the smallest stars that we have, we don't fully know what's going to happen because it hasn't happened yet anywhere. Um, so other than that, we kind of split our explanation of what happens into two groups, low mass stars and high mass stars. So low mass stars are stars that are smaller than about eight times the mass of the sun. And they have a rather pretty simple uh, death, just like their pretty simple life. So what happens first we have our star that was turning hydrogen into helium at its core, but then it runs out of hydrogen. And so that fusion stops taking place. Helium fusion is a thing that can happen, but right now the core of the star isn't hot enough for that to happen. And when fusion has stopped, we've lost that outward push that's supporting the star. And so gravity starts to take over. And gravity actually starts squeezing that core smaller and smaller. Now, as it's squeezing that core, an outer layer around the core that does still have hydrogen in it also gets squeezed smaller and hotter until it gets hot enough for hydrogen fusion to take place. And so you end up with a dead core surrounded by a shell of hydrogen fusion. And this is creating enough of an outward push that it actually pushes the outer layers out even bigger than the star originally is. And we get what's known as a red giant star. So we have gone from our main sequence to a red giant. Now during this time, that core is still getting smaller and smaller until it becomes hot enough for that helium core to start fusing into carbon. And that's when we reach our next stage. That's when we reach our helium burning stage, where we have helium burning in the core, and then we still have that shell of hydrogen as well. And the star stabilizes for a short amount of time, but eventually it's going to run out of helium in the core, because that helium is being turned into carbon. And just like before, once that helium stops fusing, the star loses its support, and this core starts to collapse again. But for our low-mass stars, they cannot get hot enough for carbon fusion to take place. So that core collapses again. We end up not only with a shell of hydrogen fusion, but we start a shell of helium fusion as well, which puffs up the outer layers again, giving us a red giant star once again, but this red giant being even bigger than the first red giant. And eventually the star puffs up so big that it loses its hold on its outer layers. Because gravity weakens with distance. The further away that outer layer is from the center of the star, the weaker gravity is holding on to it. And eventually it gets so big that gravity just loses its hold on those outer layers and those outer layers just kind of puff away. And very slowly, the star continues to grow bigger and bigger, lose its hold on those outer layers and those outer layers fly away. And um, so, so to- Sorry, really quick, I don't want to yeah. interrupt at the bad time. So we did get a question. Um, it is, I may have missed it, but I'm wondering what our star is classified as because it's actually green. Are you talking these? Can you read that again? Um, I may have missed it, but I'm wondering what our star is classified as because it's oh, actually green. Our star. Yeah, so um, our star is here-ish. Um, it does peak in the green, but it does have lots of other colors around it that peak around. 
Um, but it's it's the same kind of rainbow that you start off the cool red and then a little bit hotter orange, a little bit hotter yellow, a little bit hotter greenish, and then bluish into like a blue violet color. Um, so our sun is our sun is a main sequence star. And I can explain that later, mom, too, because that's my mom. Hi. <laughs> oh, Eli, did I miss anything? What was that? Did I miss anything? No. Okay, just, just double checking. Okay, so our star is dying. It's losing its outer layers. And right after this has happened, that gas that it's losing is still really hot, which means it glows. And what we see left behind is what's known as a planetary nebula. So that is that hot gas that's kind of been puffed away by this uh, low mass dying star. And eventually all that's left behind is the core of the star that is still super hot, but is no longer actively fusing because it, it can't get hot enough for the next stage. And so that remnant that's left behind is what we call a white dwarf. Um, so you can see here that white dwarfs are about the size of the Earth, but they have about the same mass as the sun. So really, really compact, uh, just dead core of a star. And it starts off very hot, of course, and then over time it will eventually cool off uh, and become what's known as a black dwarf. Uh, we haven't found any of those because the process of cooling off that much is right now longer than the age of our universe, um, but that's what's going to happen. All right, so let's look at high mass stars. So these are stars that are more massive than eight times the mass of our sun. Um, and they start out very similar. You have our main sequence star that's fusing hydrogen into helium. It runs out. That core starts collapsing. We get fusion or in a shell, which pushes out the outer layers into a supergiant until helium starts burning in the center until that runs out and we get back to the red giant phase again. But the difference here is with high mass stars, this process continues to happen over and over and over again. So you don't just have hydrogen fusion and then helium fusion, you then have carbon fusion, um, oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicone, all the way down to iron. And so the star keeps going back and forth between these phases, kind of getting smaller once fusion has started in the core again, and then puffing back up bigger once that stops until it switches over to the next phase. And we end up getting all of these elements up to iron created at the center of these stars. Now it stops at iron because it turns out to fuse iron, you actually have to put energy in to make that happen rather than fusion happening and you getting energy and you get energy back out. So once you hit iron, you're done. You can't fuse anymore. And that, excuse me, <laughs> leads to the very chaotic death uh, that awaits high mass stars, which is a supernova explosion. So once we have that iron in the core, fusion stops you lose that support against gravity and everything starts contracting again. Except this time, there's not gonna be any fusion to reignite and kind of restabilize the star. And that core is gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller as gravity squeezes it in until it can't squeeze any smaller. And that comes down to things in quantum mechanics, which I don't want to get into because it's honestly confusing. Um, just take my word for it for now. There's only so much you can squeeze something before quantum just says, nope, can't do it. But what happens is when that core suddenly stops, everything else, the rest of the star is still falling in. And you basically have this infalling stuff that meets an immovable object and it hits and rebounds. And all of that material rebounds back out 
and explodes off in the supernova explosion. Now, what gets left behind after a supernova depends on how big our star was. Um, first, let's take a look at some very gorgeous supernova remnants. Just like our planetary nebula, the gas that's exploded off in a supernova is very hot to begin with. And while it's hot, it glows. And that gives us our supernova remnants that we can see. But then what's left behind, like I said, it depends on how massive our star initially was. So for stars between 8 and 20 solar masses, what gets left behind after the supernova explosion is what's called a neutron star. Basically, it is a giant ball of neutrons that is roughly the size of a city, but has about two times the mass of the sun packed into that tiny little object. Neutron stars are bizarre. Um, and maybe, maybe sometime in the future, I'll do a whole show just on neutron stars because they're kind of crazy and awesome. And that would be fun. Um, um, Jessica, I don't know if it's just on my end or not, but it looks like your camera is frozen. Oh, yes, it has. Why has that happened? I did free. Can you still hear me at least? Yeah, we can still hear you. Let me... <laughs> Looks like my Zoom is lagging for some reason. Let's see if restarting my camera will make that better. Maybe. Hey, there we go. I'm back. Yep, looks good. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. All right. Um, so yeah, we have neutron stars for the kind of lower end of the massive star. But if you have a star that is more massive than 20 times the mass of our sun, there's so much stuff left behind in that core that it actually completely collapses it on itself and creates a black hole. Now, black holes are a whole other entire topic. And in fact, I believe it was our very first uh, exploration series that we did on black holes. So if you want a, a whole show on that, you can go check that out. Um, but that is the most massive of stars end up leaving behind a black hole. And there we have it. That is the life and death of stars. They all start out from these big gas clouds uh, that start to pull gas together. And if they pull enough gas in, that fusion starts, we have a star. The smaller stars have a little bit, you know, easier going life. They live for longer, but then they go through that kind of red giant phase before they start fusing helium and then go through red giant phase again before slowly just kind of puffing away into a planetary nebula, leaving behind a white dwarf. Massive stars have a much more chaotic into their life because they're able to fuse not just hydrogen and helium, but carbon, neon, oxygen, all of that stuff up to iron before they die very chaotically in a massive explosion of the supernova and leave behind either a neutron star or a black hole. Um, and that, that is that. Uh, let me get back to my Zoom here. Um, that is the life and death of stars. Um, I tried to not, it looks like I did decent on my time tonight. I tried to not go too, too crazy with information because, as you can imagine, um, since I do lecture on this to college students, we spent a good two or three weeks talking through all of the details of this. Um, so this was a, a kind of very condensed version. Um, but hopefully... You've uh, learned some cool stuff and now kind of understand all of these different terms and what ends up happening to a star. Did we get any other questions, Eli? Nope, nothing else. All right, well, if anyone has any other questions, uh, now is a great time to leave them down in the comments. And I will give a minute for those to see if anything comes in. Um, and until then, let me tell you what's coming up over the next week. 
Um, <laughs> next week is September, folks. Um, if you are in as much shock as I am, then welcome to the club. I uh, still can't believe it. Got classes start Monday. Um, <laughs> so on Wednesday is our customary beginning of the month show, What's Up September edition. Um, and then on Saturday will be, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, with Saturday will be our September Constellation show. All right. I'm not seeing anything else. Nope. So I guess we will wrap it up there. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. If you have another topic that you'd like for us to talk about during our exploration series, let us know. Because obviously we want to do shows on things that you want to hear about. Um, all right. Have a great rest of your weekend and we will see you again next time. Bye everyone. <laughs>